All good? Okay. <laughs> Let's start. <laughs> Welcome to the first talk, <laughs> Flowrite. And name is Carlos. Uh, it's, I'm extremely excited uh, to be here. I present you kind of the one and a half years of research and execution on the fastest writing experience in the world. We are creating a product that maximizes your time doing other things than writing. Uh, you can follow the slides with your phone, if that's what you prefer. You might be on your phone anyways. No, don't do that. Um, if you didn't have a chance, that's your bad. So Figma was down for a few days. They had a global outage. So that's why the slides look like this. <laughs> but I hope you can bear with me. I'm going to be talking about the AI landscape. Uh, just slowly, where is it going? Why is it going there? What does it mean for companies that want to build AI in their core and not just fancy dashboards for the executives? Um, secondly, challenges that we have overcome so far or that we are overcoming and some keep popping up again. <laughs> we thought we fixed it. Um, metrics, how you can move with confidence and speed in your product design and product development is kind of a continuation of that. Then I'll try to bring it together, what it means for data uh, in general. So this is Replit. Replit is um, a website where you can create repls, so any kind of code. And this is the, the founder, and it's showing how they integrated DAL E to their product. So you can basically go and you can create an asset, so an artifact. You can, they have like a small game uh, engine there, and you can create games. But what's cool about this is you can, if you don't have an asset created for you, you can generate it on the fly with your description. This is one use case that shows how AI is becoming the new user experience. It's your interface into your software. And it's pretty wild what this could mean in platforms like Unity or with more power. Um, it's, extra, it's, it's like time-saving technology for the developers, the game developer themselves, and it gives like alternatives. Another example, uh, DeepMind released a few months back, I think it was sometime in the, actually in the winter, a paper on how machine learning spotted mathematical connections that humans had missed. So this is an example of AI and human working together to further the field of mathematics, theoretically. So machine learning can go through papers much faster than any of us could. And this shows how the user interface that a researcher will have in the future is not anymore just web browser. But it will be an AI that assists that researcher not having to read through stuff. Now, this also applies in communication. So the user should not have to read through emails, uh, communication, and then construct their own message like they did 30, 40, 50 years ago. And this is why we built Flowrite, and we think that we can create that structure for the user already now, tackling the easier cases. There's a lot of talk around this kind of UX uh, movement. I think you call it augmenting AI. You bring it to the daily life of your grandmother anyone, but that could be their first experience with this type of product. But it will revolutionize any kind of tasks that happen currently. Well, reality is of course different from all this rosiness. So let's take, for instance, Dolly um, conversation from Twitter that happened a few weeks ago. Some of you might remember. Um, if you write prompt, Apople Vesraitis eating contarra kor durika, it, it's gibberish. Um, but you can reproduce this and you can get birds out of Dali. And, and there is an, an actual, this guy is in UT Austin, a researcher, he's saying yeah, there's a secret language that these models talk. And there's an actual other researcher that's saying that this is not right, uh, infidel, no, throwing chair out of window. But there is a consensus there that this prompt programming is super hard. So this is harder than, harder than like, a, doing AI before. Why is it? 
It's not just that there is no data, but it's because things are changing so fast. You used to have models that stay constant, but now your models expect these type of inputs to give you birds, and it gets harder. What's the solution? Don't try to perfect it up front, whatever you're building. Just ship it as quickly as possible. Ship the worst thing that you could imagine, and then build it in production. So this is called refinement. So you refine your model in production. You don't create it up front. Never create anything up front more than a few weeks. Good models are trained. Great models are refined. This was the first Flowrite product. This took four weeks of building. It has front end, back end. It has prompting built in. We even had functionality there that we know that we cannot do even now. Introductions with multiple actors. Um, we weren't gonna race after four weeks. This actual code, you can see it's hard coded stuff. You have some dynamic parts of the prompts and you're good to go, just ship it. This is from our first office. We had one table, two chairs that we carried from my place and we sat there happily for one week and then we got two chairs more and replaced those ones because my father wanted his chairs back. <laughs> and then we worked hard for a few weeks. Don't, yeah, that's cool. And then we kind of got to the real meat of it. So what is this? This is a generative tree. Here's your first sentence. Here's your second sentence, or this could be half of a sentence. And this is where your generation goes. Now this is the most probable path. These are the improbable paths. If you go to the improbable path, your customer is not happy. Or if you go to the right improbable path, they are extremely happy because your model takes risks. Now, this means that you don't wanna do this, but you wanna go wide, but you gotta go to the right destination. But how do you go there if you cannot constrain it? If you constrain the model, you get, well, you get rid of hallucination. What is hallucination? It's this, happy birthday to you and your baby. The person doesn't have a baby. What are you talking about? How do you get rid of this? Well, like I said, you, you constrain the sampling so that you don't go to the edges. But what happens if you do that? Well, you don't get to that crazy good magical result. You get to that boring, sounds robotic. Um, well, maybe not now because state of the art is further, but a year ago this was true. And what you can do to actually do better is you, you keep the tails um, fat, so you still want to go to the edges, but then you need to be kind of selective. I'm, I'll come back to that. Why is this, how does this work actually? So you have a large language model that is pre-trained. So in the industry, the economies of scale mean that only a handful of companies will be able to create models that are extremely big, extremely powerful, and that will create like a consumer economy around it. it it's not feasible for a startup anymore or even a mid-sized company to create something that is extremely good. This means that you have weights that are calculated for you by someone else sitting in Silicon Valley or other place. And then, okay, you have activation. You can give prompts like I showed you, the hard-coded stuff. You can give this stuff, but you have no guarantees that it's gonna work. If you change your weights, change to another model, might not work. Also, that model is changing. The weights are changing too. Next week it's another model, because that's the new state of the art. They created something else. So what are you gonna, how are you gonna like work in this fashion? Second problem, how to know if the inaccuracy is the model and not you? Example, Waffle House. This is the logo. This is what Dolly thinks it is. Huffy Wows, Waffle Waffy. Sneakers, sneakers. Absolute garbage Dolly. Pizza, pit, pita pizza. <laughs> this is definitely the model that cannot do this stuff. But how do you know if you're creating something that is more of more significance than just this? How can you separate between your incompetence and the model's ability to handle this kind of topical information? Red cube on top of blue cube. This is Dali's um, concept. This doesn't look like red cube on top of blue cube. Another 
thing that we also, and this is interesting because this is phenomenon that we also see in the text domain. You have two faces, but the guy looks like a skeleton. Why is that? So there's a mix up that can happen, and it's because of like frequency, it's because of characteristics in the activation phase that it mixes up things that are close to each other. It has, and also the weights are a legacy trait from the past that is constraining your ability to move that model to your direction. So that's why you get skeleton heads. It has, and it will tend towards what it has seen before. Fighting stochasticity, how do you do it? Best selection. Just create a lot of this stuff and select the best one. How can it be so hard? No published metrics. Nowhere to be seen. Google gives you nothing. No results. Deep learning, you are, it's prone to hallucinate. This is dated 8 of February, and it says, never ever has been reviewed in a comprehensive manner before. We were tackling this already beginning of last year. But big players, they are not interested in like supporting this type of activities. They want to make money, money printers. So at the end of the day, you are the one who's responsible for creating all of this stuff. You cannot just go to GitHub, copy paste some stuff that doesn't exist. Nobody wants to give it to you even if they had it. Side-by-side -side comparison is one method, actually works. A4s, highlighting, that's great. You could think maybe I'm a mechanical Turk, someone else do it for you, a farm somewhere, private data. Why would you do that? Don't do that. Stop it, get some help. <laughs> Don't do it. Metrics, these are actual metrics, numerical stuff. And you can actually create this with supervision. You can do that. And this, can, this, is the, this is like your best bet in understanding the world. So you have tens of thousands of completions. And this is actually real data from us saying that GBD3 dominates with their weights, things, and it's very hard to control length. Green one here means good. Left means bad. In the left, we can see long and short, here we can see medium. Very hard to control length. But fortunately, we have other ways than GPT-3. Useless metrics, what are they? Ones that you have not grounded to your ground truth, which is your customers. What do they think? What are the actions that they take with your product? Do they accept your answer? Do they send that email? You need to get this data or the metrics that you created and you show it to somebody, they are useless. Readability scores, useless. If, if it doesn't convert, it's useless. Measurability, you have models that can take large jumps in reasoning. So we had a case where Aro um, sent an email, GPT-3 read it, Isosari, an island in Finland, fluoride, probably Finnish, Helsinki, capital Finland, many, reason, many deductions, and then it means it's, it does that jump. We cannot follow the logic. But if you break it down, you can follow it. But if you break it down, then it, you also, you are vulnerable to these kind of errors where you get a bad prediction on the top of your waterfall and, and then you're screwed from there. But how do you go backwards and find where did that error occur? Very hard. You need observability for this. Maintenance. I already said things break all the time. Uh, things are in flux. This is the worst shape I've ever been in. Then a month goes by, you're like, no, this is the worst shape I've been in. Then another month goes by. This is the same for the models, uh, and me as well. Um, <laughs> both are in state of flux. Weights change, Silicon Valley, activation, you change, you innovate, hopefully. Inputs change, the worst thing ever. User inputs, absolute garbage, every time. <laughs> to infer or have user input. You might think user input, no. User input, yes, no. That's why templates are the answer for us, for now. But not forever. You cannot forever have a feature that helps you out. Sometimes you need to let go of it. That's why you need to unship features. Be like Elon Musk and unship stuff as quickly as you can. But you need bridge features, keep them around, but not forever. Have a plan what you do after those things. What else is bad about user input? Well, look at this garbage. Someone writes as a role, N NA, company discrim, NA. Then they write a, like a feedback to us. Why do you want to know about me? I don't want to give this data. We just want to give you a good completion. <laughs> just, just, just write 
a company name or, or just write any kind of description, not even write the company name. But you cannot trust it. But you should choose your battles wisely. So don't create AI problems where there are no AI problems. So if you can get rid of this thing by having the user write it, then don't infer it. But if you cannot, then try to help your user. Create maybe auto-completion, create some clickable features, and then hopefully you're good. But still you need to check it. Solvability, don't get too deep in any topic before you know it's actually something you can bring to the product. Um, everyone will learn this the hard way at some point. And it's always an iceberg, always. Find hacks, create small data factories, create discrim discriminators in your product. So you wanna be producing data. If you cannot, if your feasibility assessment fails, you wanna say, okay, this is undoable, but how can I do it? Create a data factory, like this, discriminators, Hot dog, not a hot dog, and well, Facebook is a good example. Facebook used to be great. You only had commenting option. People would write comments. You would get maybe 10 comments. Then nowadays you get likes. Why? Well, like is a much better discriminator than a comment, and it, the threshold to give it is very low. I used to hate it, but now I understand it. I still hate it, um, and also they are decreasing. Um, optimize the total equation. Don't just iterate on that one model. Go back and, and see, can I do better? How are we on time, by the way? I th so like it's finished. Minutes, Great. So yes, we will. Um, <laughs> so total equation, just return to it always, because there are, there are shortcuts. We had a regeneration option. You regenerate a, an output from Flowrite, and then you regenerate again. Nonsense. The total equation is super long um, road to the value. Why would you do that? Um, just offer as many as you can up front, and then there you have your discriminator as well. But just always think from UX point of view, super important, and they are converging all the time um, to each other. So AI before in the dashboard world was was more like an independent function. Now it's in the core, it needs to communicate with everybody. So when you develop stuff, um, you need to check from UX all the time. Can we do shortcuts? Can we do hacks? What can we do to be better? And, and not develop stuff that we don't need and move faster. So I already talked about the large leaps in reasoning. That can be bad because you lose observability into the process. So these things are multimodal. They take numerics, they take text, and then you might get great results, but how do you improve on that if you don't know what happened in between? You need to break it down and do it more than, than, than you would want to. And you can tackle bias if you do that. That's great for society. So try to break everything down to understandable components. It's good for us as a society. Implications for data. Small and dense data sets. You need to get these large beasts and get them to somewhere which makes sense. You need small and dense data sets, maybe 3,000 observations. You need metrics on that 3,000 observations. How diverse is this? How good is this data for this task? AI will be doing this for us, but AI is not yet here to do this for us. But we should create that AI. This will be conquering the markets. Data selection, this will be the computer doing it for us, but right now we do it. Properties of data. You have to, this is super hard. Researchers in generative AI don't have an answer how to evaluate a data set of 3,000 observations so that it would fit something unsolved. Data synthesis. How do you bring inputs from user context, let's say thread data from, the, uh, from your DOM? How do you bring intention of your user um, together in a, so that it's only signal? unsolved. Who wins the fight? The smart man or the crazy man? Q&A. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> or over. We, have some, we do have some time. Okay. to give an answer to who wins the fight, or just ask a question to Carolus in general. Rohit. <laughs> I don't know 
the answer, so I <laughs> <laughs> But you are crazy. <laughs> how do you measure success? I mean, competitive models, how do you measure one model better than the other model? It's the total equation. If, if the business goal is, it has succeeded, it's successful. But again, if you reverse back your pipeline to just that one model, not a good estimate. You do a canary deployment where you have your system running, just like Facebook has, and then they deploy to one country, they deploy something else. Then they look at the metrics and they see, are our metrics uh, within that normal, like standard deviation compared to the other? But you need to have scale to do this. I mean, but for your product, how do you measure success there? Yeah, if the people I mean, come with text, and retention. If the people change it again. Right. Yes, edits is something that we are very interested in, definitely. But that might not be fully correlated with success or no success. We have different customer types. Others are creative writers, others are ones that cannot be bothered. So we need to have maybe different success criteria for those. But at the end of the day, it's retention and the payment. But it's it's hard to kind of go back from there, but you have to try. Would love to uh, return to this topic. Any others? Have you talked to your customers like? Yes, we have a customer ops person, Daria, who basically aggregates um, from feedback calls and onboarding calls uh, in Notion, uh, different kind of uh, comments, and then we create a table based on those, and then we kind of go through which ones appear most often, and. Yeah, a, a lot of things um, there. But Eva, who's there in the audience, is, is an expert in this area. So she will be happy to talk more about it. Any more questions? I think not. Okay. Then thanks again, Carolus. This was. <laughs>